Hey, what's up, guys? Justin Fall here from The Fourth Watch, and we have got a special presentation for you tonight. Uh, we are here with the Next Gen panel from the upcoming True Legends Conference. Uh, we've got Josh Peck, Timothy Alberino, and the famous Gon Shimura, Face Like the Sun, who does not have a webcam, but you will be seeing his logo tonight. Uh, man, it's really exciting to have everybody together. Uh, we're, we've got a lot going on. Everybody's working on different projects right now, but we're coming together to discuss a little bit about the True Legends Conference that's coming up this September. Uh, it's going to be an amazing conference. The topics, uh, the people involved. Uh, man, Timothy, um, tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on right now. Well, uh, the True Legends Conference is coming up in September from the 14th to the 16th. And uh, during that conference, one of our featured events is what we're calling the Next Gen Panel, which features uh, us, as well as Owen Schroyer, who was not able to uh, make it on this broadcast tonight. And uh, the reason why we're, we've are we decided to do a, a Next Gen, what we're calling a Next Gen Panel, is because the topic of the conference is transhumanism in the hybrid age. And transhumanism is going to profoundly affect our generation before we're dead and our kids for sure and most definitely our grandkids and that's a statement that the generation in front of us really uh, wasn't able to make this is a phenomenon that's going to begin to uh, manifest in our lifetime and so uh, we wanted to address the uh, the millennials. I mean, I'm right on the edge of a millennial. I was born in 1983. So um, I just made it into the millennial category. And so um, we're being primed right now. Millennials are being primed. We're being primed and our children are being primed to accept the dehumanization of the human race, because that's what it's about. It's about post-humanism. And so really what, what's, what, what, what we're trying to catalyze with the conference and 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 I know through your guys' work, all of you independently, Owen Schroyer with InfoWars, is a a resistance against the dehumanization of the human race and standing for traditional the traditional values, traditional trademarks, I should say, of humanity. And when I say the traditional trademarks, I'm talking about the genetic trademarks. I'm talking about the the sociological trademarks the societal trademarks of the human species, because we're losing the ability, not so much us, but certainly our kids are losing the ability to even communicate with one another anymore as human beings, the way that human beings have been communicating for thousands of years. I mean, even the most fundamental, the most basic interactions of the human race um, are changing now, right now are changing. And this change has only really uh, only really began about uh, a decade and a half ago. And so this is brand new. There's no, the only precedent for the age in which, uh, in which we are entering, which is being called the hybrid age, not by us, but by futurists and technologists are calling the age that we're entering the hybrid age. And that's why we're calling our conference um, transhumanism and the hybrid age. The only precedent for the time that we're entering is the world before the flood of Noah, the pre-flood world. The first hybrid age, because we're getting ready to enter into a second hybrid age, a new hybrid age, and the ramifications could not be more calamitous for the human race. And that's why um, we are the resistance. That phrase has been used and, 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 and rehashed so many times by so many different organizations. But let me tell you something. It applies to us most coherently. Why? Because when we resist the dehumanization of transhumanism, we are defending the human race. We are the defenders of humanity. And uh, so that's what this conference is about. And that's what we're going to be discussing on the Gen 6 panel. I'm sorry, on the next gen panel. No, that's awesome. We've got uh, we've got a handful of things we want to talk about tonight. And uh, the cool thing that I just want to say as we welcome everybody on tonight is that everybody on this panel has done some type of work exposing transhumanism. Um, goodness, I, I was involved in this back when I was in college. Uh, I, I focused uh, in all my psychology courses, uh, all my thesis projects were dealing with transhumanism, transgenics. Um, at the time, we were told this was crazy. This is never going to come to fruition. 
Um, and, and here we are now, we're not so crazy anymore. Um, we're seeing things happen with the technology that are being woven into the fabric of our everyday lifestyles. Um, so much to the point that you can't even go to Starbucks or, or your local coffee shop or even church. You go to your church and the kids are all just like this. I mean, they're not even communicating anymore uh, without social media. Uh, there's so much to get into, but I, I just want to say everybody on the panel tonight and who is going to be on the panel uh, at the True Legends Conference, we've all done uh, a decent amount of research and work into understanding transhumanism, where it's come from, uh, where it is currently, and where it's estimated to go. So um, anyway, let me just go ahead and welcome on Josh Peck. Josh? Hey, how are you doing, Justin? Great, great. How's it going? It's going great. Good to see you again. It's been so long since we've seen each other. It's been, what, five hours maybe? <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw Josh at work today, so. Yes, yes, which which is, uh, it's always good. It's actually, uh, for, you know, for those who don't know, I went through this knee surgery thing, so I had to work from home for a while, but it's nice to be back and uh, uh, everything. But yeah, it's good to be in this panel talking to you guys. So Josh, uh You've done quite a bit of, of research into the transhumanism agenda, and uh, I'm just going to say this. Um, what's cool about having Josh around is that, Josh, you take almost a little bit more of a conservative view on some of the topics than I do personally, or that even Timothy might take, or Gons. We all, we all kind of bring different angles to the table. Um, one thing I like about you, Josh, is that you challenge people um, not to just believe all the crazy right up front. You're very skeptical about accepting some of the crazier information. Um, I'm skeptical too, but I tend to dive into it and say, you know what, there, I, I'm quicker to say there's reality to some of this probably than you would be. Um, but we're at a point now on the timeline where these things are in our faces. Like you, you just, you can't deny, uh, the technology and where it is, um, with the transgenics, you know, modifying DNA, bringing in all types of technology. Uh, what are some of the latest things that you've noticed, uh, about transhumanism and some of the transgenic technology that's taking place right now? Yeah, and I got to say, my mind has actually been blown on how advanced this has become in our uh, current age. Because you're, you're right, with a lot of things, I tend to be uh, a little bit more skipped, skeptical than most. But uh, a lot of that was because uh, a few years ago, I would be really, I used to be really susceptible. And uh, there were more than a few times where I was proven wrong. And I got a little sick of that. So I, I started having some more skepticism about it. But, but th this one... Um, uh, you, you, it's it's difficult to be too skeptical skeptical about what is ahead. And I wanted to know what was actually going on, what uh, transhumanists really believe, what they think. And so um, I invited one on on my show on Into the Multiverse, uh, Zoltan Isvan, and we had a really good conversation. Uh, we completely disagreed on everything, but. Um, the, the the point of that was, and and this is I, this is something I think is lacking in the church, and that, that's why I'm glad that this conference is happening, that this panel is happening, and also that uh, prominent transhumanists are uh, and transhumanist thinkers and 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 people like that are being invited to take part in the conference and speak because I believe that we do have to hear out the other side, not so our minds will be changed and so we can can be convinced that their way is the right way. You know, I mean, if they uh, were able to come up with a compelling enough argument that everybody could make up their own minds on that. Um, but not, not because of that, but because it, it sharpens our own arguments better. And we can't really know what our arguments are until we hear the opposition. So I took one of the most, um, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know, uh, flamboyant maybe is the right word, uh, transhumanist in existence. I mean, he drove around the country in a van shaped like a coffin trying to spread the message of transhumanism. I mean, we don't, we as Christians don't drive in cars shaped like crosses to spread the gospel. So uh, something's got to be said for that. But I, I really wanted to know what he what he thought and what he believed. And yeah, it was it was a productive uh, conversation. But for me personally, it really opened my eyes to how prevalent this is and really how evil this ideology is behind transhumanism because it subverts the cross. It subverts everything that is good that we believe in. And uh, j just real quick, you know, and something that's been discussed all throughout human history is, is morality. What exactly is morality? Now you have more nihilistic people in the world who believe that it's Morality is just a sub uh, a subjective preference that we all have. You know what? Whatever is good for you is good for you, but it doesn't mean that it's good for me. And there's no objective standard. Well, if that's the case, then sure, 
transhumanism makes a lot of sense to some people. But if that's not the case, if there's an objective morality that we can all uh, at least, uh, you know, on a human level adhere to in some sense, unless we're just in denial, uh, you, you know, then, then it's a different story altogether. Um, I contributed a chapter to a book called The Milieu that was a collaborative effort from uh, people at Skywatch TV and, and some other researchers out there. Um, and uh, in that, I discussed part part of that, the, the, the morality issue, because there are those out there um, who would attribute morality to biology, who, who would say morality is nothing more than another term to describe biological humanity. Yet, if that's the case, that would mean the less moral you are, the less biologically human you are. So, you know, would that mean that there are certain regions of the earth that uh, where, where people inhabit that may be a little bit more primitive than we are, yet they're not a, as human because of that? You know, I, I would seriously doubt people who aren't, uh, you know, people on the left side of the political spectrum would be really willing to uh, admit to that. So I, I think that's an issue. What what the topic of morality, what, what that specifies. There's a political issue, too. If transhumanism actually becomes a reality, and it is now, you know, this isn't some far off thing there. They're, th it's happening now and it's only going to increase. Well, is that going to thrive in a privatized environment uh, through capitalism? Uh, and I actually think that's where it'll thrive the best. Or is it going to be through government uh, programs and, and more on that approach? Which if that if that is the case, I, I think people tend to think that that's more scary, but it will stave it off a bit because, you know, let's face it, the government isn't good at anything. So uh, it, that'll slow down the process a little bit more. But still, I don't I don't advocate for uh, government control of anything, let alone something like this. But but that's why we're here. We're, we're getting the word out because uh, I think people are still uh, mo many people are still stuck in this idea that this is not a big deal. It's a very small faction of humanity. It's a uh, it, it, it's a very small counterculture. It has no bearing on anybody's lives right now. And if it does, if anything does come out of it, it won't be for another century at least because technologically we're nowhere there yet. All of that is false. Uh, and Justin, you can even speak to this in, in Hollywood, in uh, children's cartoons and in, in media, uh, a, a popular media and entertainment. This this idea of transhumanism has been uh, shoved down our throat, but it's not called transhumanism. It's called the Avengers. It's called uh, X-Men. It's called Spider-Man. It's called all the things that we as millennials grew up watching uh, and, and still love. And, and I and I do, too. They're great stories. But uh, but at the same time, they still have this agenda that's being pushed and has been being pushed, meaning that what, once this technology is readily, readily available for the masses, it's going to be accepted uh, because there's that nostalgia part of it, too. So, uh, yeah, I am not a skeptic on transhumanism anymore. Uh, I haven't been for quite some time now. Uh, and and I and, and you're right, I do. I, I do tend to be more on the skeptic, skeptical side with this kind of stuff, but I well, can't Josh, deal with transhumanism. Yes. Let me, um, I want us to get into the Hollywood aspect of these things here in just a second. Um, but speaking on the morality clause, if you want to call it that, um, that's a perfect time to go ahead and bring on Gon Shamira. Yes. Uh, Gons, you and I have done programs together uh, between Fourth Watch and Canary Cry Radio where we've talked about transhumanism. And I think one of the interesting little tidbits that you have kind of brought into my mind is that there is a faction of so-called Christian transhumanists. Tell us a little bit about that, how you got into this topic and a little bit about where you're at right now with your studies. Sure. Yeah. You know, uh, when I first started looking at transhumanism, it was the thing that clicked, you know, everything in place for me in terms of what was going on with the the Nephilim and the Old Testament and, and understanding what Jesus meant by it, as in the days of Noah, understanding what was going on at the Tower of Babel, all those aspects made sense to me when the modern transhumanist movement, you know, made itself sort of uh, apparent. Um, and, and I myself, I'm the same as, uh, born the same year as Tim, so uh, go 83. Hey, 83, 83 me too. 83, that's three of us. That's two. Oh, I'm 84. You're all older than me. You're so, all ancient. Why don't you we type all, in, get to, yeah. <laughs> type in, in three for 83 in Gematria and see what we get. Oh, God. <laughs> Just, um, but here, here's the thing that the, the aspect of Christian transhumanism, and that's what I was going to bring up actually was the diversity of 
of uh, approaches to this because it appeals to all religions because it seems to have a an eschatological and I don't mean that in like a you know negative end of the world but just in terms of an end of things it seems to have a resonance with a lot of people with the new agers it's the ascension with uh, you know, even with Christianity, the new heaven and the new earth, these ideas have been there. And certainly those are true things that we're, we're waiting for, but, uh, there's a big obstacle in the way, or a big thing that happens this antichrist, this anti counterfeit Messiah thing that's going to happen that the church doesn't seem to pay attention to, uh, that, that my concern is that with the church, not just not talking about the issue, but, um, even more so, I think, uh, I'm, I'm probably, uh, I don't know, three quarters of the way through, I'm not going to put a timeline on it, but Age of Deceit 3 is moving along very quickly and it's coming together very, very nicely in the last month and a half. Um, but that means that I'm categorically disturbed about where things are headed. <laughs> and I, I know that, that Josh talked a little bit about the skepticism of transhumanism before now, how he's not a skeptic. Um, but you know, th this idea of a hive mind now we've thrown the idea around the Borg and, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, of course they're trying to build the hive mind. Um, but the, the, the concept of a hive mind and group think and actually creating a network of people uh, to better humanity is a huge, huge part of what is happening. And it's something that's been projected from I'm, I'm discovering much earlier than most people would think i mean you know you, you'd expect the scientific revolution and then you know all this stuff and of course there was always you know writings in the kabbalah and things like that and there have been researchers to show how kabbalah and quantum science seems to be the same thing it's a modern repackaged version of it uh but the occult origins is unreal and and the fact that the communication technologies we have right now are effectively what long-awaited occultists have talked about it's it's amazing when you read some of these quotes from about 100 150 years ago 130 years ago here's one from helena blavatsky who i know you guys are familiar with if you're not she's a, a late 18th uh, or 19th century occultist she was a very influential in uh, american occultism and bringing the eastern philosophies out here but she said this in 18 i think it's 86 i have it zoomed in here but she said telepathy as it is now called, is the communicating of thought or idea from mind to mind. This is a branch of occultism, a part of which is known to the modern investigator. But it is also one of the most useful and one of the greatest powers we have. To make it of service, uh, many things have to combine. While it is used every day in a common life in the average way for men uh, are each moment telepathically communicating, this is what she believes, um, to do it in perfection, that is, against obstacle and distance, is perfection of occult art. Yet it will be known one day even to the common world. And man, is that if that's not a description of the internet, 140 years ago by an occultist, I don't know what is. And what's emerging out of this, and, and you, you combine these writings from, from back then with the modern writings of not just New Age, but business, talking about networking, talking, there's a book called The Seventh Sense network becomes the new it's not just the sixth uh, sixth sense where the humans can uh, gain these extra perceptions through a sort of transhumanist transhumanistic thing but it's also a seventh sense where um a hive or a a sort of conglomerate human arrives this neo-human that is uh, not just individuals but a collective and it goes back to collectivism, co collectivism and monism and all these ideas that are prevalent um, in places like, the, you know, Burning Man, uh, which I know, Justin, you're maybe going to go visit. I don't know if that was uh, concluded yet, but these ideas are pervasive in culture. And the, the thing that is different about now uh, compared to any other time in known recorded history, you know, what's what's generally agreed upon is like known history is is the technology. And so I know we've had this sentiment of like, Hey, technology is benign. It's neutral. Like it's how you use it is how, and I've definitely thought that. And I think for the most part, that is true. But the more I learn and the more I get into the nitty gritty of like how computer science, not just works, but just how the operating systems from the ground up were designed, the elements of 
control, the control mechanism of loop feedbacks of, of you know, the, what eventually became the MK Ultra experiments with the sensory sort of loops and controlling your, you know, trying to change your perceptions and emotions based on physical torture and, and all, you know, all the crazy stuff that they did. All that was built into the computer right from the get-go. So I don't know, guys. I, I'm, I'm a little disturbed in terms of like the direction this is heading, especially with the hive mind concept, not just because it's this technological thing, but because it has sociologically changed us. Like you said, Justin, the p- kids with their phones in front of their faces. I mean, I'm guilty too. I sit there a lot of times and I'm reading something or I'm trying to learn something at least, but I do have my phone in front of me. And so um, the, the danger with the combination of not just the tech, but the social media aspect is where the hive mind is really becoming palpable, not just you know, it's not just like a group think anymore. It's like with the technology in our hand, we are agreeing about something. And that collective notion is um, is very interesting. And it's going to be a very dangerous thing in the next decade as the technocracy becomes established and techno populism becomes a real issue as well as techno spiritualism. Everything's becoming techno in this next decade. And so I think that's why we're here talking about all this. The religious aspect is what gets my attention. Uh, like I, I tend to kind of, I, I, I kind of lean towards the most extreme side of how the, this is going to play out religiously, um, you know, with the spiritual side of everything. But when you talk about the hive, this hive mind, this collective, uh, I remember back in early 2000s, there was a program on PBS. I think I might have mentioned this on Canary Cry Radio, but uh, anybody can Google this. There was a program that came out called the Worldwide Mind. And PBS, as liberal as they are, they they had the whole good cop, bad cop routine. You know, they've got a guy that's like so like so far crazy transhumanist. And then they've got this other guy that, that represents like the average conservative American Joe. And they kind of go back and forth, good cop, bad cop, so that by the time they're done completely conditioning you that you need this cloud. They didn't call it a cloud, by the way. Okay, this was way before we even knew what the heck a cloud was. But they were selling this idea that there was coming a day, they were already working on the networking for it and these supercomputers that were going to be powering this this worldwide mind, this hive, this collective. And if we have the hardwire or the 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 we're not hardwired, but it's like if we're if we're networked into this thing, and I, I don't remember the exact language, but the gist of it was if we're networked in, um, via microchip, via frequency, whatever you're, you know, however you're connected to this thing, you can download a language instantaneously. Like you yeah. speak Chinese now. Um, Gons, I could be having a community, uh, like you could be laying in bed with your wife and I could just like whisper in your brain, Gons, Gons, hey Gons. Oh, that's terrifying. Are you there, Gons? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I, that's how creepy this is. We can communicate with this. Um, but then you made another statement um, about telepathy, and, and I don't want to go on a tangent here. Um, you know, the popular mega church out there in California that everybody has, goodness, all the headlines about Bethel Church, uh, the Destiny Cards, and all this other crazy stuff that's been going on there. Um, their children's pastor put out a video on his Facebook Live saying that every baby can be communicated with telepathically by its parents. Like it's actually something we need to learn how to do because your babies are born with their, their, it's like they have a mature spirit, but they haven't learned how to communicate on this planet. Right. And so as a parent and his name's Seth Dahl, by the way, I'm not making this up. If anybody's watching this and they think this is just totally crazy. Uh, This is the children's pastor at Bethel Redding, California. He says that he telepathically communicates with his infants and that he encourages Mm -hmm. other parents to do this. Um, are you recommending, Gons, that there's an element of telepathy that's possibly this this psychic part of our brain that gets activated by technology in all of this? Where are you going to go with that? Yeah, I think what they're going to do is, in, in part of this, and I just pulled this up because this is so relevant, and I know we don't want to go too far down any given rabbit trail, but there was an article that was published um, by ABC titled, Telepathic Communication Just a Matter of Time as Twins Reveal Blueprint for Brain Interface. And it's um it's a conjoined twin. These these two girls have their their heads are fused together. That's how they were born. But they have like you know they they're able to share experiences. They're sh- they're able to share uh kind of you know the tastes and and uh you know things they crave or th- their thirst or things like that. And that is the key here. It's it's electric signaling. We're all just electric signals. Remember. 
So what's going to start happening is now they've already done it. They've already mapped or, or tried to map parts of rats' brains and stuff, and they're able to show the electrical pulses that are taking that are taking place in the brain. They've even uh, created a, a whole procedure to go through and digitize that brain into the cloud. So yes, rat brains are already in the cloud. Um, and, and so I think what they're going to start doing is not just digitizing it, but the the thing that's really creepy in, in the most cutting edge research it's not it's not necessarily implants you know we've always talked about microchips and implants and stuff they're talking about we're not going to need any invasive stuff we're, we're going to be able to use the silicon type of uh, infusion technology and we're going to be able to to get the kind of reading and you know the the back and forth interaction uh, electrically that we need via the brain so i think that there's there is Already, there's already tons of technology being made to do this, but it, the, 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 the implications are so crazy because if you start thinking about memories, right? They already implanted a memory in a rat or something. Uh, can you imagine if uh, you know, we're sharing memories or sharing experiences? These are going to become normal types of things where the celebrity culture will completely change because you know, people want to live vicariously through them, through experiences and things like that. It's going to be a whole different world. And so, yeah, I think communication at, at that supernatural level, that's that spirituality side. And then the technology is going to show it. It's going to help facilitate some of that, you know? And, and for, for example, like the digitization of the rat's brain, they were able to literally take a, a piece of flesh and uh, map it out digitally completely from top to bottom. And, and now they have a digital version of a brain that they're able to uh, effectively give it new memories or transfer that information to another uh, rat across the country uh, with memories and things like that. So, you know, it's all, it's all, it's, it's pretty invasive towards our minds. And that's the biggest thing here is, is this is an assault, not just on the body, but the mind. Um, they have to assault the mind first before they can really assault the body. And I think that's what we're seeing, especially, you know, with the breakdown of the family and the transgenderism and all these issues, it's all to break everything down uh, to create something new. And again, that's something that they, uh, someone like Julian Huxley talked about in the 1940s, that we're going to purposely create tension across the political and social and education and economic and everything so that a new thing would emerge and, and a collective new humanity will emerge. And that, that's kind of what they're going for. But the religious side of it is certainly a big vehicle. And I think we need to have that discussion because the church man we're, the church is ignorant right now with, of the topic they just don't know, you know they they're they're uh, they, they're going forward with the tech without any sort of uh checks and balances they're just kind of keeping going with the culture and that's that's a, a huge trap because that is a huge part of the new world order system the unesco system it was uh, the three prong approach education science and culture so speaking sorry, of the religious rambling. side of it guns um just a few weeks before our conference in September, again dealing with transhumanism and the hybrid age. Uh, by the way, it's at the Branson, it's it's at the uh, Mansion Theater in Branson, Missouri, and also live streaming is available right now. You can go on Gen6.com to get your live streaming ticket. You sign up for live streaming now for this year's conference, and you get last year's conference for free immediately. Um, but just a few weeks before our conference, there's a um, a faith, technology, and the future conference that is being put on by the Christian Transhumanist Society. It's a Christian Transhumanist Conference. Right. They, they're, li they're literally preempting our conference with their own. And uh, this isn't, these aren't futurists, these aren't secularists, these aren't humanists, these are so-called Christians who are not only, who are far worse than ignorant concerning the question of transhumanism. These guys are, um, these guys are, um, complicit in the uh, in the accepting of of what transhumanism teaches in, in terms of um, um, mixing it into their theology, and I've seen a lot of this, and I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of this too. These mega churches are already primed, and when I say mega churches, I think everybody thinks the same handful of churches are already primed to to amalgamate the doctrine of transhumanism into their watered-down version of the gospel. The stage is already set for this to take place. Um, this conference, their, their, their main speaker at this conference is 
Aubrey de Grey, who is a scientist who's working uh, to end aging. He wants to defeat death and uh, find a cure for aging. And he's, he's a very famous guy and doing a lot of work um, to try and defeat death. So I think it was you, Josh, that mentioned um, one of the spokespersons for transhumanism that you interviewed was driving around in a coffin to, yeah. try and, uh, to try and get the word out about transhumanism, to try and uh, proselytize the, the doctrine of transhumanism. Really, that coffin is, uh, can be used to, to, to accurately depict the problem that we have which is the human condition. The problem that the human race has is sin and death. We are in a state of extreme genetic degeneration. We are not Adam. We all want to be Adam again, hence the, um, all of the superhero movies that are coming out and so forth. This is, as you said correctly, Josh, this is transhumanism in our face. These are uh, people who have been genetically enhanced in most cases. Uh, most of these superheroes are genetically enhanced, and they represent, in a way, psychologically for us, they represent Adam. They represent what, what, what we once were, what we long to be again. I believe that every human being is secretly longing to be Adam again. And so this, this desire to defeat death, this de the desire to overcome aging and defeat death has been the deepest and most profound longing, longing of the human race all the way back to the offspring of Adam. All the way back to Adam himself after suffering the consequence of sin, which is death. And death is a consequence of sin. Death is our condition. Death is our fault. And not just death, entropy. Entropy and death are our fault. We brought death into the world. The Bible says that through one man, death, sin and death enter the world. And it's through one man is the rectification of sin and death. And it's not Aubrey de Grey. It's Jesus. And so this effort to defeat death, this effort to overcome aging is a circumvention of the cross of Christ. It is a circumvention of the rectification of the human condition, which is the resurrection. The resurrection is the rectification of the human condition, period. And any attempt to rectify the human condition, I'm not talking about curing diseases. I'm not talking about increasing lifespans. Um, using technology, I'm talking about becoming something other than human in order to circumvent the human condition, circumvent death, circumvent the cross of Christ and the resurrection. That's really what transhumanism is about. And any believer that embraces the doctrine of transhumanism has forfeited the doctrine of Christ, period, and cannot be considered a believer because Paul said that our hope as believers is the resurrection. That is our hope as believers. In fact, Paul says that if the res if Christ was not raised from the dead, we are to be most pitied among men because our hope is in the resurrection. The hope of the believer is not in this life. It's not in extending his life. It's not in curing aging or any of that. We understand that, the, that we are bearing Adam. We wear Adam. We bear the consequence, the ramifications of sin, which are death. And that all of us will die, even those of us who have embraced the cross. Why? Why will we die? Because we're still wearing Adam. That's what the resurrection is for. We die because we're wearing the first Adam. We will live eternally because we're going to put on the second Adam, the last Adam. That's the resurrection. And the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of atonement and the resurrection in Christ is what is what is most lacking in uh, in churches today. The, the, the foundational pillars of what the early church believed, the crucifixion of Christ, the fact that he was buried and raised on the third day, the fact that he ascended to the Father, and the fact that there is a resurrection, the hope of the believer, the resurrection for those who are in Christ. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and this is what is not being preached in most churches. So the churches are being primed to accept a counterfeit resurrection, a counterfeit gospel with a, a circumvention of the cross of Christ, a circumvention of the resurrection to live eternally through the, uh, through the mechanism of, of transhumanism, tr through the mechanism of transhumanism, because transhumanism is, it's not just a philosophy. Transhumanism is a transition. It is a transition that takes us from being human 
through transhuman to the ultimate goal, which is post-human. Post-humanism is the end game. And understand that post-humanism means that to be post-human is to forfeit your candidacy for salvation. What makes you eligible to, to receive the gift of God, the, the eligibility to receive the gift of God is the fact that you are a human being. If you are something other than human, then our kinsman, human, redeemer, it no longer qualifies for you. The cross of Christ is an all for you if you forfeit your humanity. That's what ought to be being preached from the pulpit, not this acceptance of transhumanism, not this desire to defeat death through other means. Again, I'm not against uh, curing diseases and, 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 and doing things that, that don't change the trademarks of human beings. That's where the danger comes, because the only way, the, and I'll kick it back to you guys, the only way to circumvent the human condition, to circumvent the resurrection, is to become something other than human. Because herein lies, in this body and in your bodies, herein lies the curse of sin, which is death. Our hope is in the resurrection, and that is, is, uh, is, as I said, what ought to be reinforced right now in every church across this nation and across the earth to shore up, to, to, to relay that foundation of the gospel, which has been little by little over the years, gradually broken apart and destroyed by these various movements, so-called uh, movements in within Christianity. You're absolutely right. And isn't it interesting that even the transhumanists know for any hope of eternal life or immortality, however they want to phrase it, they have to become something other than human. Isn't that interesting? Because they, they could have phrased their whole movement differently. They could have they could have said, no, we're still human. But we're the true human. We're we're the human that 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 is supposed to be. You know, uh, it's not human to die. It's not human to do any, you know, to degrade and 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 and, and be subject to entropy and all that, all that. They know that they know within themselves intrinsically. They know that that's wrong. They have to become something different than human in order to to to, to gain what you know what they would say is immortality or what we would say is eternal life. You know, we as Christians, we know that the only hope in uh, eternal life is through Jesus Christ, then we will never get it in humanity. It's strange that the transhumanists know that too. But what's also interesting is that they forgot what the definition of human is, and they forgot what morality is. Uh, you, you know, we can we can generally agree on a lot of uh, the same points of morality. You know, a, a lot of a lot of the more transhumanists or secularists uh, fall back on. Uh, ancient Greek philosophy and stuff like that, you know, like the non-aggression principle and stuff like that. So we can meet them on their own terms. So so let's say, you know, a human being can be defined in a, a broad sense, you know, pretty simply. You know, the the, the dictionary says uh, this, a man, woman, or child of the species, homo sapiens, distinguished from other animals by superior mental development, power of articulate speech, and upright stance. Okay, now, you know, Part of being human is, uh, you know, we're made in the image of God and all that. But let's meet them on their own ground. Let's say, okay, they don't believe in that. Fine. We can meet them on their own ground with logic and reason. The majority of transhumanist goals, if they were actually successfully carried out, they would not fit with that definition uh, or rather they, they would actually surpass it. So human sapi uh, homo sapiens now compared to other animals, uh, they're considered to have superior mental development. However, one of the uh, goals of transhumanism is to increase that development to a state far surpassing what's possible for mere homo sapiens. So we now have the power of articulate speech, yet something like uploading a person into, uh, well, Gon like Gans mentioned, a global brain or a hive mind or something like that is available. The speech available uh, that, that would be available in that environment would no longer be articulate or even understandable to a normal homo sapien, to people like you and I. Uh, even the idea of upright stance would would be a moot point in a virtual environment. But this is why uh, this this is why I think transhumanists explain transhumanism as uh, a directed evolution from Homo sapiens to something new, uh, you know, improved, enhanced, and and, and totally different. The the type of being uh, that's 
uh, that they're referring to that, that that's that's going towards this directed of you know with this directed evolution thing is called ho homo superior or you know that's when you see the lowercase h with the plus sign uh, at the end of it that's what it's referring to or sometimes it's called uh, homo uh, futuris or, you know f futurist but one of the more troubling things about that concept is how this is going to be done and what it means for the rest of humanity and even on their own terms it goes against the non-aggression principle so. Much of transhumanism relies on the implementation of genetic editing, and we're seeing that a lot today. So basically, in a nutshell, the idea, for, for those who might not be familiar and are just brand new to this topic, the idea is that a person can alter their genes uh, or, or DNA to enhance their overall biology, and that's being done today through biohacking. Uh, just in, in, in people's garages and stuff. Uh, now, this would greatly reduce the limitations of human biology. You know, certain enhancements might include, um, uh, you know, maybe starting off with small things like giving people super strength or night vision, uh, but but could also be as extreme as possible immortality or an immunity to every known disease. And now, while those are certainly, you know, tempting outcomes, there's no way to know what the future ramifications of those enhancements might be. So one definite and unavoidable consequence to transhumanism is the passing down of edited or enhanced genes through your generations. If a person alters their genes and they have children, that gets passed down. Now, this means eventually a world could conceivably exist where the choice to conceive human children with a human partner would be totally removed, thereby forcing the transhuman uh, agenda on the rest of the human population against their will. And this is this is something that I don't think a lot of transhumanists really think out because most of them say that they're not totalitarian. Everybody can do what they want, you know. They're 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 more social liberals and that type of thing. Everybody can do what they want, but they don't realize that if they are uh, if they are successful in their goals, they're taking our our choice away for future generations. You know, it, it, it might it might be defined as merely like a personal choice today, but that's only valid for at the most one generation at most. So, for example, we could compare it to like getting a tattoo. You know, I got a few of them myself. It's a personal choice, okay? But uh, if 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 a tattooed person has a baby, you know, I have I have uh, three, four, uh, one on the way. Um, they're not born with tattoos. You know that 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 choice was my own choice and it's not passed down uh in, in the generation so a baby's not also born with tattoos now with transhumanism the future generation has no choice and once that choice is made for them there's no going back a human superior baby could never grow up and decide to be a, a homo sapien uh, e even if there is uh e even if they morally disagree with what transhumanism has done to their biological makeup i mean even we as christians uh even we as christians offer that choice uh to humanity if you don't want to be a christian fine then you don't have to be a christian um and there's a lot more i could say about that but i i don't want to i don't want to take up the whole conversation but i'll i'll just say real quick that you know also a, a homo superior or a, a post human it's not just created out of thin air a, a homo sapien is needed to create a post human or a transhuman or a, ho a homo superior which means for the addition of every homo superior one homo sapien is lost and over time those two factors one being the shrinking uh, Homo sapien uh, gene pool and the loss of existing uh, Homo sapiens being the second, it would eventually result in a complete species eradication, and that's known as speciesicide. Uh, now, while the great evil of genocide is defined as, quote, uh, the deliberate and systematic extermination of a national, racial, political, or cultural group, end quote, speciesicide in, in the context of uh, what we're talking about today is the actual extinction of an entire human species. It goes beyond uh, genocide. And I, I would think that if, 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 trans, if transhumans were, were consistent, and I'm speaking generally, but if they were consistent in their own ideology and their own ideas, if they would follow it out to the ultimate outcome, they would realize, okay, in order for us to have our little movement here and uh, and, and plan it out to fruition, that's species side. Uh, there, there's just no way around it. Eventually, it's going to reach a tipping point on Earth where humans, Homo sapiens, do not have a choice anymore. And there's good reason to believe that possibly that's what's being talked about in a lot of the book of Revelation. So I'll, I'll turn it back to you guys.
Yeah, let me uh, let me just comment on immortality real quick, Josh. Um, you start throwing words like that around, and people instantly conspiracy theory meter goes off in their head. Um, the truth of the matter is, uh, immortality that might be found in this life it's still temporary because once the great tribulation is is done, you know, I, I mean, look, things are going to happen during the great tribulation. The Bible is very very clear. Yes. And and during this time period, uh, I mean, there's going to be some things that are going to come to fruition during this time period that are not going to happen before this time period. Like there right. are things they are predestined for this time period. Um, well, and you can the, even meet you can even meet the secularists on their own terms, you know, because and, and yes, and I fully agree with that, and every Christian should agree with that. But if you're if you're debating with a transhumanist or a secularist, you can still make the same point and say, well, look, even on your own scientific terms. The, the the universe is either going to suffer heat death or or, or uh, a freeze death. One of two things, eventually, maybe it takes billion, billions of years, but because of the expansion of the universe, eventually everything's going to freeze and die. Where's your technology then? Nothing can survive in that environment. Or the Higgs field doomsday, and that's a whole other thing. But, but basically, which could happen at any second, uh, the universe becomes a, a true vacuum where particles can't even exist and everything gets ripped, ripped to shreds. If people want more information on that, uh, check out Joe Licken's presentation on the Higgs field doomsday. By their own standards, they know no matter what technology you develop, uh, it, it can't sustain that because the, 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 what they theorize is actual particle eradicating uh, forces and processes. No technology can surpass it. So you're absolutely right. For the Christian, yes, we got we got tribulation, we got prophecy, we have all this stuff that we know is going to happen uh, from the book of Revelation and Daniel and, and, and all that. But for a secularist who doesn't believe in those things, the point I, I think is even more clear that based on, on their, their, cult, their so-called science, this is all going to end someday. You're going to die. It doesn't matter if you live 100 years or a billion years. You're going to die. You're going to cease to exist physically. What next? But if God does allow any type of, we'll just say, um, presumed immortality, because I think that's what it's going to be. Right. Uh, these transhumanists, they're going to be able to access certain technologies, right? And and I think we get a little clear glimpse of this in Scripture, because when you go to Revelation 9, 6, I'm just going to read this for everybody here. Uh, and in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. And they shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. So there's something very peculiar about this passage. Some shift is going to take place. Now, I believe it has to do with transhumanism. Now, I, and I want to get everybody's opinion on this if we have time. I think that, that there's something that's going to take place. There will be a shift that takes place, physical slash spiritual shift that takes place, um, which will affect mankind in the tribulation. And again, I don't mean Christians, uh, and, and I don't want to get into eschatology. Everybody's got a different opinion on that. But the Bible is very clear. There will be elect on the earth during the tribulation. So whether, you know, everybody has a different view of who those elect are. I think we all know uh, we all have our own views on that. But regardless of who the elect are on the earth, there will be Christians, born again Christians on the earth in the tribulation. Um, they will not take this transhumanism. They will not have anything to do with it. And they're not going to try to kill themselves. But for those who do take part in the beast system, OK, those who go through whatever this looks like and I can't paint a picture, I don't know what it's going to look like, but something's going to happen where they will want to seek death and they can't find it. They will not be able to kill themselves. As for right now, people just go out, you know, go out back and, and you know, pull out a gun or, or take a bunch of pills. I mean, right now there's a suicide rate. There's coming a time where man won't be able to kill themselves, according to what I'm reading in Scripture. Now, Timothy, let me jump to you real quick on this. Well, um, I think that uh, I think that certainly that there are technologies that are under, under development right now in synthetic biology and biotechnology that are going to create all kinds of scenarios. Um, I mean, people are talking about nanotech bodies. People are talking about uh, extreme forms of cybernetics. Uh, so certainly these technologies are underway, they're under development. They are going to emerge in the consumer market shortly. This is one of the drastic changes that we're gonna see in our lifetime and that our children, I've got four boys, by the way, our children are going to deal with. 
is this emerging market uh, for human modification, for the for the alteration of human biology, whether it be on a genetic, whether whether it be on a genetic level, whether it be using nanotechnology, whether it be cybernetics, artificial intelligence, uh, or integrating a technology into your biology. And this is going, it's going to, it's going to create a scenario in which um, people are going to be forfeiting the traditional um, meat sack of, the, of human flesh, and they're going to attempt to upload their consciousness to, to machines. I don't think, um, you know, I'm not convinced that a machine can have a consciousness of, it, of its own. Uh, I'm not convinced that the singularity is possible, the singularity as it pertains to uh, Ray Kurzweil's theory. Uh, however, I do think that there might be, it might be possible to, to a degree, to move consciousness into a synthetic body. Um, and that's underway. There's all kinds of, of experimentation happening there. What we have not yet seen is the consumer market. And the reason why we haven't seen the consumer market yet is for two reasons. Number one, the technologies are st still developing. Right now, we're witnessing the convergence of what are called the green technologies, genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and I would throw in cybernetics. Um, these technologies are, are, are converging. They are converging. And the convergence of these technologies are going to make possible the conscious evolution, the directed evolution of the human race. Uh, generally speaking, through biotechnology and also synthetic biology. And uh, synthetic biology in the sense that people can create new life forms. Now, college, uh, high school students are already creating new life forms, single-celled organisms that do different things. Like uh, there was a competition a, a couple of years ago to among the high schools, which high school, uh, and it was all over the world, could create the most interesting, the most useful synthetic, new synthetic life form and I believe the winner of that particular year was uh, a, a, a single cell organism that could eat. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of a word. The um, not plastic, the uh, uh, asbestos or whatever it's called, the, the, the dangerous substance that gets, gets into your lungs and gives people all kinds of respiratory problems. Uh, so high school students are already creating synthetic life. Um, and so if you can create synthetic biology, if you can create a new life form, um, we're going to be able to rebuild biology, to mold biology, to direct the evolution of other species, but also our own evolution, not in the Darwinian sense, not in the uh, sense of survival, survival of the fittest. This isn't a natural process. Directed evolution is not Darwin. Directed evolution is Nietzsche, Frederick That's Nietzsche, right. the will to power. And it is the kind of evolution that the transhumanists embrace. They don't embrace survival of the fittest. Screw that. They are subscribing to Nietzschean philosophy, which I'm going to be talking about the conference. And so the objective is going to be, just like these Christian transhumanists are dealing with this year, in this month, the end of this month in their conference, how do we defeat aging? How do we defeat death? Well, the problem is here. The problem is Adam. Adam is dying. Adam is degenerating. Not only are we all going to die, we're all sorry excuses of human beings to begin with compared to our progenitor, Adam. And so we have a problem. We wear it. And the, the, ultimately, we're going, to be able to make, um, we're going to be able to make modifications to our flesh. We already can to a degree. There's a misconception out there that we're living longer and healthier. We're not. We're actually not. We're living slightly longer than our predecessors. If you subtract the... Um, infant mortality rate from the 19th, from the 20th century, take out the infant mortality rate, the, the, the children that were dying at birth or uh, up until two or three years old, subtract that out of the equation. They were dying for all kinds of reasons that, that, that no, no longer occurs because we've, we fixed those issues. Take that out of the equation and we're only living slightly longer, slightly longer with all of our technology than our predecessors. However, we have way more diseases today than they did, certainly way more genetic disorders than they did. In fact, we have more than 10,000 genetic mutations, deleterious genetic mutations in the human genome, more than 10,000. So you tell me, do we repair this thing or do we try to build a synthetic body and transfer our consciousness into that thing? 
And I think ultimately repairing this body is only going to get us so far. And, 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 and we're going to have to resort to transferring our consciousness or building some kind of a synthetic body or something along, becoming something other than human this is basically what it boils down to, as Josh was saying. That's where this is going. So those entities, those creatures that we create, either to try and house our own consciousness in there or some kind of a nanotech body or something, there's all kinds of crazy things that are being dreamt up now by the futurists. If we succeed, in creating some kind of an artificial suit, instead of this suit, we create an artificial suit, a synthetic suit. We we put our consciousness into that suit. The question is, does the soul go with it? I don't know. Nobody knows. But I think the consciousness can go. And then what happens? And then you might be getting into, this is a very long-winded answer to your question, to, um, uh, Justin, but then we might be getting into a scenario where you've screwed around with the blueprint. And now you've created hell on earth for yourself and others who are in your situation, who, who maybe move their consciousness into this, uh, this synthetic life form. And people are probably thinking, oh, that's crazy. That can't happen. Well, then you answer me. How is it that demonic beings, sentient entities can inhabit your body with you? Right. How do they how do they get in there with you and not just one or two? We're talking legion. 400, 500, if, we're, if we can take that literally, which I think is probably pretty accurate. Hundreds, hundreds of sentient entities. These aren't just Casper the ghost. These are sentient beings that once had flesh and are disembodied. So that disembodied thing that is still them, that consciousness, can go inside of your body. So if the consciousness of a disembodied basically the, the offspring of the watchers can enter your body then why can't your consciousness go into a synthetic body and i think they're inhabiting the same space to be honest with you i think that demons and the human soul whatever you want to call consciousness they're inhabiting the same dimension together and so i do think again i do not think that uh um the singularity is possible that machines are going to uh, become self-aware and conscious to the degree that we are, but I do believe that synthetic biology is possible, and I do believe that the human being, the consciousness of a human being, just like the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, can be transferred into a synthetic life form. And there, that may be the key to understanding, um, Justin, uh, what you're talking about, how it, how it is that that death will escape them, will escape those who have done this, uh, for many reasons, and um, that's a frightening, that's a terrifying prospect. If if life on Earth becomes hell on Earth, yeah, I'm gonna let jump me in. let oh, uh, John. Can I can, let me clear something up real fast yeah, before you comment? Um, when I when I bring up Revelation and, and I start talking about uh, all the stuff that's going to happen, um, I just want to make it really clear. Obviously, like I, I don't believe. The Christians are going to be here when God's wrath is poured out over the whole earth. I, I definitely, I, I, I believe in a pre-wrath, um, and I don't want to give the, the wrong impression. I don't believe we're going to be here when wrath comes down. But my point was, based on the timeline of events, things are cooking up to that point. And I think God's going to allow these, these wicked men waxing worse and worse, seducing, deceiving, and being deceived, right? Um, I believe he's going to allow them to seduce and to continue to get worse and worse, and their technology is going to get greater and greater. Uh, giving them this 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 goal of finally not being able to die for a season, and I think that's the season that the wrath is going to get poured out. Um, and so basically, they've kind of dug their own grave, and it's kind of like now they're going to lay in it. You know, they're gonna they're gonna suffer. Uh, I just want to clear that up. Uh, I hate even having to bring that up, but uh, eschatology can confuse people, and I didn't want to create any confusion on that. But Gons, please chime in. Well, I was just going to jump in, and I think most of this conversation can be summarized or parsed out by looking at Romans 8 and in uh, verse 5 and 6 for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh and those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for those uh, for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace it's a passage we you know we hear about all the time we hear it in church and whatnot but if you apply it to this topic it becomes quite profound because 
if you look at the pursuit of transhumanism, of the hive mind, all these things, it is a flesh pursuit. It's predicated on humanism. It's predicated on uh, the scientific inquiry and what we've, um, uh, you know, extracted from the data that we've, you know, gathered from human biology, from human uh, testing and measuring and all these things that we've done. And, you know, it's, I think, I think the thing that Tim's getting at with this notion of, um, you know, this assault and, and, and this alternative thing that they're trying to usurp God and, and usurp the, the cross, really, that's the heart of it. But people don't really see it that way. You know, that, that, that's a really hard road to get to. I'm, I'm hoping the folks that are Christian transhumanists, the, the people that maybe are introduced to the idea through them, because they're much more culturally relevant. I mean, they got like, they got like the Mormon transhumanist there. They got like a like a lesbian person and a theology people from Princeton, and they got like you know they got a lot of academic people there. So it's possible that your average Christian might hear about transhumanism through a group like Christian transhumanism first. But my hope is that you know if you're a Christian and you've been taught sort of the basic tenets of Christianity, my hope my hope is that people will see sort of the reality of like wait a minute this they're talking this is a religion this is a new religion that they're pushing um because it's totally spiritual they are tackling the big question where do we come from why are we here where are we going and those if those issues are being tackled through the flesh then here's what we have we have transhumanism we have this crazy hive mind thing that i think they're building and um you know one of the things a lot of these issues with like you know josh brought up like hey we have a personal choice right now like you know i'm gonna tap myself up like a like a heretic like Josh is. I'm just joking. I'm totally joking. <laughs> I joke around with Josh a lot. So anyway, um, but I think I think this is going to the part that's not discussed and the part that has blinded the church, especially, is the culture, because culture is such a huge element. And I think this is a it was very apparent in, in the recent discussion uh with Carl Tykrib on Canary Cry Radio, talking about Burning Man, talking about how their theme is iRobot. There's, you know, the whole tech industry has had a close tie with Silicon Valley and the psychedelic movement of the nineties, which has its ties to the CIA and all the, you know, the sixties freedom movement and all that stuff. It's all part of the same movement. And if you look at their documents, you look at what they wrote and they have, they're very explicit that this cannot work unless it is based on humanism. It cannot be based on, you know, uh, it, it, it can have different tenants. It can have your, you, you know, it can be Islam. It can be. Christianity, it can be you know Hindu, whatever, but it has to have a humanistic uh, tenant that we are all coming together, we are all improving, we are all uh, going in the same direction, which is you know up, ascending. Um, that notion has to become very prevalent to society, and that's not going to happen. Um, I, I think that is going to happen more as some of these communication technologies become even more crazy. And I think the big thing that uh, we need to look for is this topic of empathy. Um, it's very, I mean, it's for me personally, I have, I mean, I'm not as empathetic. My wife is super empathetic. She has a gift. She's able to kind of sense people, you know, just by looking at them. Um, this type, how, what, if you look at it technologically, what is all that stuff based on at an empirical level? At an empirical level, we're talking about blood you know, blood pressure rising, uh, pupil dilating, um, you know, uh, heart rate changing, um, you know, skin tone change, like little, little physiological differences that can now be measured and that can now be fully sort of transmitted into a data set. And then other people can experience it. And you, you start talking about, you know, having those sorts of empathetic moments of, Hey, we're trying to understand each other through this technology. Now you have this hive mind thing where you, again, you start messing with your own thinking. That's where all the sensory, that the flesh, when you're going at it from the flesh, outside in, you're going to mess up the, the spirit, the soul inside, like, like Tim, Tim was talking about. And I think that's the, the point here and the warning that's been in the scriptures all along with Revelation 13 and just the whole big you know, mythological spin, that, the, the craziness that we read about in, in the book of Revelation and Daniel and things like that. It seems so radical and crazy, but now... Now it just seems like it's it's happening, and it's all predicated on these technologies and human imagination. That's a big tenant. You look at the Tower of Babel. It's a point I always bring up, but I think it's so pertinent. Um, the reason why God uh, stopped the Tower of Babel, one reason was 
that you know they would do whatever they imagine to do that anything they imagine to do will be possible so all of a sudden with this technology anything we imagine to do is now possible you know it's it literally is you can create virtual worlds you can become whoever by you know putting on an avatar whatever but it completely separates you the person from your body and it is a pseudo spirituality that's that's very pervasive i think it's going to be that that whole notion of the spiritual part is going to become the next uh, phase of how culturally this is going to draw people in. Um, and again, as we've talked about in this discussion that many of you guys have brought up uh, the church, I, I don't, I, I'm hoping again, I'm hoping a lot of people that are introduced to this, like if, if like a super hardcore Christian transhumanist walked into like a, a fairly mega church, I'm hoping there's some people in there that are like, ah, I don't know. I feel like there's something more to this and maybe find, you know, some of our work. And, and maybe think, oh, maybe there's a better explanation from this, not even from not even using eschatology, just from a philosophical standpoint of, you know, refuting the, the basic tenets of, of materialism and reductionism and bringing it back to Josh, how he started off with nihilism. You know, I always take it back to if you're if you're logical about your atheistic worldview and materialistic reductionism, you're going to end up with uh, you're going to land in nihilism, which means that anything that you deem as meaningful or purposeful is categorically a delusion it's an illusion it's something that you're making up to occupy time until you go away so i mean if you believe that then all you have is to sustain this whatever this is and so it makes sense to try to build you know uh eternity living forever to defeat death all these aspects that are uh you know the promises of god through the cross through, through jesus christ well now we're in this age just like it was in the days of noah where humans have the technology at their fingertips to try to do the same thing that God already did on the cross. So yeah, I mean, it all, it all goes back to, you know, some of the stuff Tim talked about, but I just wanted to throw that in because there's, there's so many different um, layers to this. Uh, and I think we're doing a good job covering all of it just in this short discussion. But um, yeah, I hope people come to the conference and they're able to to see that like, there's, there's a lot to this. This isn't just like, this isn't just a, a you know, a Marvel comic superhero propaganda type thing there's there's a lot more to it um and uh just it's kind of the eugenics topic that you guys brought up too that josh mentioned uh have you guys seen the movie storks no nope okay it's it's an animated movie for kids you know it's kind of fun whatever the the storks that delivers the babies except there's one glaring disturbing part of this the whole movie the 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 main corporation or whatever is a giant factory machine thing that creates babies like the babies that were being delivered to the families that you know couldn't have children or brothers or sisters or whatever, it was just babies being created out of a factory. So, I mean, I mean, I, it sounds like something I would watch being thirty-five years old, single with no kid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I'm well, being thirty-five years old and, and having younger children and having seen it, that was the. I, I was trying to enjoy the movie, but it was a little hard when they were like, "Oh, the machine turns on, and now it's spitting out hundreds of babies." What are That's you going to do with all these babies? So anyway, I'm sorry. Kind of rabbit trail. Go ahead. No, you mentioned uh, Blavatsky, and I, I think a good kind of sum up point here um, would be kind of going back to what Aleister Crowley said. And for those who don't know Aleister Crowley, um, you know, he called himself the beast. Um, he's probably one of the most, if not the most influential um, black magician, occult fathers uh, of our lifetime. Like, uh, I mean, literally... Um, I mean, granted, he he's long gone now, but when you consider all his works and all of his spells and just, I mean, I, I can't, sometimes I, I, I just, I can't put into words the magnitude of some of these things. Uh, people wouldn't even know if they haven't studied, but Crowley, um, you know, majorly influenced uh, Jack Parsons, um, L. Ron Hubbard, Led Zeppelin, I mean, Black Sabbath, the list goes on. Don't have time to break it all down. But, um, his religion, Thelema, one of his religions, Thelema, um, he defines in that religion what magic is. And, and I think this is really telling. Um, basically, it's uh, causing change to occur in conformity with your will. And, you know, his number one commandment, if you want to call it that, is, you know, uh, do what you want. Do it, uh, do it thou wilt. It will be the whole of the law. It's all about you, self. Um, causing, you know, causing change to manifest based on what you will. And 
witchcraft is very much, you know, delving into that same idea of uh, manifesting your will into reality, basically. Um, lots of different types of uh, occult movements have kind of spawned from all this over the years. But I bring that up to say that's what transhumanism is doing. Um, they've got they're, they're literally trying to manifest their will through technology. And it's a form of magic. And again, how far are they going to get? I don't know in our lifetime. I think it's very important that we keep an eye on this. Um, we're being conditioned in TV shows, cartoons for kids, uh, movies for kids such as Storks. Uh, when we did the episode of Into the Multiverse, uh, when Timothy and Josh and I did that, uh, we talked about this X-Men episode where that yeah. blue creature, um, Nightcrawler, uh, the, Nightcrawler. Or, or, no, yeah, no. yeah, Nightcrawler, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you can Google this, Nightcrawler, the gospel. And it, it's crazy because Nightcrawler gets saved. I mean, not really saved, but they're giving the idea that Nightcrawler saved and he's trying to uh, evangelize Wolverine. Um, very demented. And then they go into this whole universalist, all every every faith is all worshiping the same God, even though they're holding a Bible, right? Um, we are being conditioned for a time that is coming upon the face of the earth. And I think it's very important that we are on top of our game here, that we know what's going on, and that we know what the Word of God says, most importantly. Uh, it's the Word of God that allows us to have clarity in times of so much confusion. Um, that's our absolute truth, is the Word of God. and. Um, We've mentioned kind of in passing how this is a religion, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that one of the topics we're going to be able to discuss on the panel is the ramifications, the religious ramifications, but not just the ramifications, but what it will look like as a religion, how this is going to appeal to everyone of every faith, including those claiming to be of Christ, right, um, and how this technology could potentially uh, deal with affecting what they call the mind's eye or the pineal gland, which is um, what a lot of the hallucinogenic drugs, and I think I've said this on Canary Cry before, but I don't think hallucinogenic drugs are just that simple. I don't think it's a matter of just getting high. Like, oh, I just took some drugs and I had, you know, I saw an entity. No, no, I think that a lot of these drugs, whether they be synthetic or natural occurring, uh, I do believe that a lot of these so-called hallucinogens are actually uh, sacred, sacred drugs meant to access the spirit realm. And I'm hoping that we have time to talk about that on the panel. That's something that I, I got into quite a bit in my thesis in psychology uh, and how that how transhumanism and transgenics, uh, I believe, are going to tie right into the synthetic religion of the last days. Uh, but we've all, we all have different ideas of how this is all going to play out. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that it's all going to end in fire, according to the Bible, because if, if you're not with Christ, you're going to get quenched in the fire eventually, and there's going to be hell to pay. And it's my desire that people like us can sound the alarm and be watchmen to try to warn people. Um, and I know that non-believers, we can't just go to them and say, this is what the Bible says. I mean, granted, we, we have to preach the gospel to them, but they want some peer-reviewed research. And it's like, well, look, let's take your peer-reviewed research and let's compare it to what scripture says. You know, I, I mean, that's that's you get to a certain point where that's sometimes the best thing you could possibly do for some of these guys. But uh, I pray for discernment in these times because it's really hard to get through to some of these people, especially some of these Christian, so-called Christian transhumanists that you guys have talked about. Um, it just, it blows my mind. Uh, but I know we're almost out of time. Timothy, uh, I'm going to pass that over to you. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the the topic of my presentation in Branson this year is going to be what I call apotheotheism, the evolution of a new religion. And it's a new religion for the new hybrid age. And it's unfolding before us at this in this very moment. It's it's uh, maturating in the in the Christian Church, or the so-called Christian Church, the mega churches, the emergent churches, many of the charismatic churches, and I'll begin to pick up the transhumanism, the theme of transhumanism, but not not as a a topic of concern, but rather are already beginning to adopt the doctrine of transhumanism. Um, it's happening. It's happening at an exceedingly rapid pace. And so uh, that is our that's why we we're doing this conference this year. We want to prepare people. We want to uh, make sure that people are equipped. And that's specifically why we're doing this next gen pa panel. What what you what everybody has heard on this uh, panel tonight on this uh, digital version of, of what we're doing at the conference live is just is just the beginning of the things that we're going to be getting into. We have a list of topics that we're going to hit. 
that uh, um, is much broader than what, what we've talked about today. And we, again, we're going to have Owen Schreier with us, and um, it's going to be extremely dynamic. It's going to be epic. And we want to make sure that we're thinking about not only what's happening in our time, but more importantly, uh, what's going to be happening in our kids, in, in the age that our kids are going to grow up in, in the epoch that our children are, are growing up in, which is which is the Aeon of Horus, by the way. And so um, the True Legends Conference is from the 14th through the 16th of September. Uh, you, can, you can do early registration on the 13th, uh, that Thursday. The 13th is a Thursday, and Steve Quayle is going to be doing a book signing if you want to get a, uh, a book signed and uh, early register early, which I recommend people do because there's going to be a lot of people. There's going to be 3,000 people converging at the Mansion Theater uh, on the 14th. So it's Friday the 14th, and then it's um, a Saturday the 15th, and then Sunday the 16th of September. The Next Gen panel is going to be taking place on Saturday. And we're, I think at this point we're sold out. Of physical tickets, you can go to gen6.com. That's G E N S I X.com. If you want to go to the conference, do you want to see if there's a ticket left? I don't think there is, but you can check. But certainly, you can you can sign up for live streaming. And uh, as I said earlier, the live streaming for this conference, when you sign up for this year's live streaming, you automatically get access to all the sessions from last year's conference. In other words, you get last year's conference for free. Sign up for this year's conference live streaming. You get to watch last last year's conference for free on the website on gen6.com after you create your account. So it's going to be dynamic. It's going to be it's going to be a very powerful time. We have um, we have aside from our next gen panel, we have uh, obviously Steve Quayle uh, and myself from Gen Six Productions will be presenting. We have Tom Horn and and Sharon Gilbert from from Skywatch TV. We have David Knight. From Infowars, who's one of our keynote speakers, will be presenting. Um, and obviously, Owen Schroer is going to, from Infowars is going to be on our uh, panel. We have um, um, we have Hugo de Garris, who we're flying in from China to be with us. Hugo de Garris is uh, the author of the Artelec War and one of the uh, premier developers of artificial brains. Has been one of the premier developers of artificial brains. He's coming. We have Richard Dolan from the world of ufology, who's going to be talking about some very interesting connections between ufology and transhumanism. Very, very fascinating stuff. Um, and I, I, I can't remember who else we have. But we, David Langford will be with us on Sunday. And so um, this is going to be powerful. This is going to be an epic conference. Last year's conference was epic. This year, I guarantee, is going to be even more epic. So join us. Uh, on the live stream, that's gen6.com, G-E-N-S-I-X.com. See the Next Gen panel live uh, with all of us and Owen Schroyer. And um, again, we've got a whole list of topics that we didn't even touch tonight that are we're going to deal with uh, at the conference. So, gentlemen, thank you for accompanying me tonight on this uh, digital Next Gen uh, panel. And I look forward to being with you guys in Branson. And, and uh, I know it's going to be powerful, and I know people are already excited about it. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. awesome. And uh, we will uh, we will have just gotten back from Burning Man. So yes. So, uh, and we will, and we definitely want to discuss Burning Man. In fact, just Justin, in fact, I, I, if you can, bring some pictures that we can display up on the, uh, the big screen while we're talking. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're gonna have to blur out the background. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, bring some G-rated pictures, Justin, that we yeah, can display. But uh, I just wanted to say, um, like we 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 didn't want to get too much into that tonight. There were so many topics that we that I really wanted to, talk about but obviously, um, we we just we can't dig too much into those topics that we're saving for the actual conference. But I know we've got a lot of topics to talk about there. We we'll have just gotten back from Burning Man. I robot. Um, and there's going to be so much stuff happening. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys out there in just a few short weeks. Um, Josh Peck in closing, bro. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Well, yeah. And, and if we got a couple of minutes in closing, I'll wrap it up by making one point that, uh, you know, there, there's a question to uh, that every skeptic of transhumanists 
has, transhumanist idea has, uh, especially those who are Christians, you know, people like you and I. And I, I think that probably a lot of people watching are wondering the same thing. Where exactly is the line? You know, where where does human biology improvement stray from ex, uh, acceptable to unacceptable? I mean, we have plenty of technologies and medical advances today that can, you know, cure diseases and ailments through the use of technology. So, you know, when, when we think about it, would somebody with a prosthetic hip be considered a transhumanist? You know, probably not. Well, what about those who receive laser eye surgery? Or what, what if a cure to cancer uh, could be found through genetic editing, you know, which is currently being researched? Uh, what, what if a human being could be genetically edited to become completely resistant to all disease? You know, where is the line? And I, I want to address that before we sign off, because I do believe that a lot of people have that question. Uh, th and there's been a lot of different answers offered by people throughout the years. And it, it seems uh, there's no real general consensus that, that has been reached as of yet. So I can only really speak for myself in attempting to you know provide some kind of answer. Uh, my personal belief is it comes down to the difference between restoration and glorification. So is the medical treatment restoring what was once there, or is it glorifying it into something that is uh, perceived as better? You know, is and I've had a hip replacement. Is the hip replacement an attempt to restore a person's normal use of their hip, or is it an attempt to you know, improve the bones and muscles to the point that they they now can no longer break or wear down. Uh, is the laser eye surgery restoring a normal human uh, level of vision, or is it providing somebody with an unnatural ability to humans, like night vision or infrared vision or something like that? It, is it restoring the person to normal human ability, or is it glorifying the person to superhuman ability? And th that's where the line is for me, at least personally. It, it's found at that point where a person can no longer be considered human because they've advanced into something else, such as homo superior, as I've talked about before uh, during this during this broadcast. So going further as a Christian, I, I, I would personally have trouble accepting anything coming close to changing myself from human into something else. I, I would regard that as giving up my promised inheritance of glorification from God and the life to come for an inferior human and, and technological glorification in this life. So we'll, the fact of the matter is we're all going to have to stand before God someday. I mean, e even if immortality in a physical sense were even remotely possible through you know technological means someday, uh, it, it doesn't change that fact. Death will still occur. And I, I, I mentioned this briefly earlier. Eventually, our sun is going to burn out. Our planet will become an uninhabitable. Uh, even if we found another planet to live on, the universe is eventually going to come to an end. Uh, due, due to all the exponential expansion of the universe, a day is going to come, again, in the secularist uh, mindset, a day is going to come when everything will be too far away from everything else to have any sort of ad advantageous effect. You know, basically stars aren't going to be able to warm planets. Gravitational orbit uh, is going to be a thing of the past, basically. The universe itself is going to die. So in the case the universe, excuse me, ends earlier than that in a, you know, massive Higgsfield doomsday event, even time itself would run its course. So no matter what, you cannot escape entropy forever. Now, transhumanism is a stall at best. No matter the level of sophistication of technology, nothing can truly live forever in this life. The next life will come for each and every single one of us. Uh, I personally believe that it's wise to acknowledge that fact now and plan accordingly. We're, we're, we're going to be on the other side of death far longer than we've ever been on this side. And you know, may, maybe I'll be as lucky as to live 80 or 90 years, but after death comes, I'm going to be on the other side until the end of time and even beyond that. You know, my, my concern is not getting right with the technology an imperfect, flawed and human race can provide. You know, my main concern is to be right with the creator of humanity, the, the universe and time itself, because only he, only that creator of those things can truly save me personally. Uh, so the good news is, 
for those watching is he has provided a way for salvation and he's guaranteed glorification. Now, it doesn't require government funding. It doesn't require uh, private corporations and it, it doesn't require waiting for advanced technology to be developed. It's, it's available right now to every human being on earth. And even better, the God who saves desperately wants to give you this gift through his son today and is only waiting for you to accept it. He wants it so much, in fact, that he gave his own life for it in in, in, in the form of Jesus Christ, it, 100% man, 100% God. It, it, it costs you nothing. The cost has already been paid. Uh, to truly prepare for the future, I, I would suggest asking Jesus Christ into your life today and begin believing and following him. If you do this, God, Jesus guarantees that what transhumanism can never offer. They can never guarantee that you will truly and eternally be saved. And I'll end with this, John 3, 16 from the King James Version Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. That is the most important message uh, of the ages, of any age. Jesus Christ, that is our answer. And uh, it's because of our love for the gospel and our love for the truth that we want to get out here and that we want to uh, just follow the command in Ephesians 5.11 to have nothing to do with the wicked works of darkness, but rather expose them, or the King James says, reprove them. Uh, I kind of like the word expose better. That's the more modern word, because that's what we do. Um, all darkness is going to get brought to light. And that's what we do as Christians is that we we mark the false teachings, we call it out, and we try to educate people on what the truth is uh, according to the Word of God. Gons, in closing, take us out. Uh, well, I mean, with Josh, um, your analogy of uh, enhancement versus uh, glorification is interesting because I, I have a similar measurement um, in discussion with people concerning the topic of transhumanism, and that is uh, restoration versus enhancement. Um, I think it's a it's a good apologetic when you take it to glorification, um, but when we're talking just in a practical conversation, it might be um, something that's more applicable if you frame it in the uh, in the position of um, restoration versus enhancement. Because you know, if you study the history of like plastic surgery, they've had plastic surgery for like hundreds of years, but it was always to like fix horrible injuries or people that have been deformed and things like that. It was to restore people to make them feel like they can, you know, function in society. That all changed in uh, what is it, the seventies, eighties, or something like that, when plastic surgery became a thing in Hollywood. So it's interesting how even that, like, that became enhancement, you know. And it's a culturally—I mean, I don't know if it's entirely accepted, but it, certainly in California, in Southern California, um, those types of practices are accepted. And so that is a cultural. Um, issue where they have accepted culturally an, a notion of enhancement not from any sort of benefit other than aesthetically. And so th that mindset is what I think is going to be uh, more pervasive in in how this becomes normalized. Um, and that's my baby in the background there, if you can hear her. Um, and uh, this, I don't know if you guys can see, is the screen, is it sharing my screen or is it sharing my logo on the screen? Uh, see logo, but you can do the screen logo. share if you want. You'll be on full screen. I thought I did the application here, but let me see here. This is um, I just wanted to share this from earlier. Is it doing the screen now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is um, this is a cover cover of the book God and Gollum Inc. Uh, by Norbert Weiner or Weiner. Uh, he's the father of, of cybernetics. So this is the guy that actually like pretty much came up with the whole concept of cybernetics. So, I mean, like I said, this stuff is, uh, the education of, of what this stuff is and, and the origins, the more I learn, the more I'm wanting to build a farm. But I, you know what? I can't add a whole lot to what you guys said in terms of the, the greater implications here because uh, really, the, it, you guys have all brought it back to the gospel and I have to agree with you guys there. And, and I think the, the importance here, which is so interesting, is that the simplicity of the gospel message is lost in all this technology and all the the stuff that we're, you know, social media and all this stuff. Um, and I think ultimately the the biggest message that we're going to have is that like bringing it back to that simple gospel message. It's not really any different. You know, yeah, we talk about like, you know, the crazy things, all the the gnarly stuff happening out there, but that's, it's not so much that we're making it up anymore. It's, it's, 
we're just commenting on what the world is providing out there and showing us. And, you know, a lot of it does need to be taken down or at least called out. Um, and, and obviously, you know, in the world we live in today, even calling it out doesn't make a difference so much anymore with uh, certain sectors of our, uh, of our, you know, at least our digital existence. But yeah, it's all back to the, the simplicity of the gospel message. And that's what I hope people walk away with, with from uh, our discussion, um, you know, the next gen conversation. How do we bring this conversation to the next generation? Well, we got to have the, the foundation first. We got to stand on that solid rock. Um, and, and I think all of us here are doing that. And, you know, hopefully that, that part of the message is clear because I think people can be introduced to this stuff and, and not realize that we're actually trying to preach the gospel here, guys. We're not, we're not trying to say like, go run and, and, you know, build a cave or something. Although that doesn't sound like a bad idea. Huh, Tim? You can help me out, build a cave. Uh, did you say build a cave? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to respond to that. You have you have all that space up there in Montana. Yeah, Tim, all those caves that you built up there. <laughs> we can all just move to the Amazon and quit all of this business and our lives will be much more simpler. No, you <laughs> told me know. way too you told me way too many horror stories about those well, little know, man, after what you said, man. We'll be all right. I got a I got a little plot of land that I just purchased down in Antarctica. Uh I'm naming it base two eleven if you guys want to join me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but listen uh no listen one more time uh just to let everybody know if they didn't write it down before september 14th through the 16th of 2018 it's literally right around the corner branson missouri um that's where we're going to be broadcasting from they are sold out but you can get your live streaming package right now at gen6.com that's g-e-n-s-i-x.com all spelled out gen6.com and uh, we've been talking with Gon Shimura, Josh Peck, Timothy Alberino, and myself. And uh, again, we we didn't even scratch the surface on on the the meat of what we're going to be talking about at the conference. We are saving that for the conference. But uh, we're just having a little fireside chat here tonight, and uh, we hope you guys have enjoyed it. And want to thank you all for tuning in. And uh, until the next time we meet again, God bless and good night. <laughs>